Luke chapter 11. We're going to read verses 1 through 13. And uh, I did my best uh, to hack and slash material for this sermon. But this might be the one morning I resemble John Payne. I usually don't. Uh, He's a wonderful preacher. But today we might match his length. So going to do my best. Let's get to it. Luke 11, verse 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? May God bless the preaching of His Word. As we enter 2024 together, it's the desire of your pastors to focus our attention as a church on the vital topic of prayer. Why? Why a series of sermons on prayer versus our normal practice, which is to go through a book of the Bible? Handful of reasons for you. First, we are commanded to pray, and we want to be faithful. If you know your Bibles, you'll be familiar with this. But here's a brief sampling. Luke 18, 1, Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. And we're wise to note that that's the danger. As we pursue prayer, we can easily lose heart. Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And Paul, again, in Romans 12, 12, Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Constant in prayer. And then Jesus again in Matthew 21, 13, quoting Isaiah, he said to them, it's written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. A personal reflection. I've been a pastor in two churches for over 35 years, getting close to 40, And as I've participated in leadership, I mean, I'm I'm not throwing any shade here on the churches. You're one of them. Not throwing anything. Um, But the churches I've been part of over those years have been known for believing in spiritual gifts. So it was formerly called charismatic, now continuationist. And we've been known for being reformed. And so when the church is commonly described, it's described in those ways, uh, reformed and continuationist. And it's always a tad uncomfortable for me as a leader to note that Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. As I've had people interact with me over decades about what a church is like, I've never had a person say to me, is this church a house of prayer? It hasn't been my experience. And I'm not knocking reformed and continuationists. It's all good. 
I mean, those, those are fine descriptions and people should know. That's not the discomfort I feel. The discomfort I feel is I wish, I desire that we'd be called a house of prayer, by which I don't mean changing the name of the church. It does not have to do with the name. It has to do with the reality therein. So, one, we're commanded to pray. Two, we know personal holiness matters and we must guard against a drift toward worldliness because we always drift away from truth. We never drift toward truth. So, we must not forget Revelation. We spent a great deal of time preaching through that book of the Bible, and that book warned us that we will either love God or love Babylon. We must pray in that fight. Third, uh, we each have a personal relationship with the Lord. We have a personal walk. Some of us may have cooled in our walk. Some of us may have plateaued. It's not what it once was. We would be perhaps in danger of leaving our first love, while others of us perhaps have never really had much of a relationship. It hasn't been a strength of ours. Prayer reveals our relationship with the Lord. Prayer is the revealer. Four, we are expecting great things from God and attempting great things for God. We're aware of our need for help. We are aware we are dependent people, and we need God's help. God cannot be thwarted. So one of the first things I requested in helping with the building project here, I asked the guys if I could begin a prayer team because we're undertaking a major project that requires major dollars, and there is the risk of serious error, serious mistakes, and one feels dependent, and one is aware of need for help. So I'd like to thank those who have been a part of that team praying for the building project. So we pray. But before I dig into the text, I want to take a moment to define prayer. What is prayer? Prayer is conversation with God where we bring our worship and petitions to Him. So if you look up various definitions of prayer, you will find some people define prayer as a conversation with God where we talk and we listen as if it's a, a two-way street. We happen to listen to God best when we read the Scriptures. They are infallible. They are perfect in all their ways. We listen to God best when we read the Scriptures, and we pray our best when we pray the Scriptures. The prayers in the Bible inform us that prayer is speaking to God. And it really is that simple. A child can pray. So a few definitions for you. Tim Chester, in his book, You Can Pray, I find Tim Chester almost always helpful. Uh, you Can Pray, be my favorite shorter book on prayer. He says, if you've ever asked your dad for anything, then you know how to pray. And I believe we've all asked our dads. If we don't have a dad, of course, that would be the exception. But we've all asked our dads for things. Paul Miller in A Praying Life says, All of Jesus' teaching on prayer in the Gospels can be summarized with one word, ask. Martin Lloyd-Jones in the Sermon on the Mount Prayer is beyond any question the highest activity of the human soul. Man is at his greatest and highest when upon his knees he comes face to face with God. And J.C. Ryle, an Anglican bishop from the 1800s. I enjoy him so much I almost want to be Anglican, but not quite enough there to get there. Ryle says, it's useless to say you don't know how to pray. Prayer is the simplest act in all religion. It's simply speaking to God. It needs neither learning nor wisdom nor book knowledge to begin it. It needs nothing but heart and will, which is a very wise definition because Jesus is always concerned first and foremost with our heart, and therefore we are wise to do the same. So prayer is not about length as in lots of words, and it's not about time, as in lots of minutes. Uh, John Bunyan put it this way, the best prayers 
have often more groans than words, and those words that they have are but a lean and shallow representation of the heart, life, and spirit of prayer. Uh, Spurgeon always puts it well. Uh, Some brethren pray by the yard, but true prayer is measured in weight, not by length. A single groan before God may have more fullness of prayer in it than a fine oration of great length. Not many of us, this is my prediction, would say we're happy and satisfied with our prayers. I believe most of us would describe ourselves as somewhere between mediocre and failures. That would be, I suggest, the majority of us, and I'm including myself in that. I'm in that company. But we will see that prayer is good news for the saints, and I agree again with Spurgeon who said, I usually feel more dissatisfied with my prayers than with anything else I do. So let's turn our attention to our text. The text is Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer, so-called. Matthew 6 is slightly longer, but the same basic content, same principles are found in both prayers. My title is Lord Teach Us to Pray, and I'll make three points from the text. Verses 1 through 4, we need to make specific requests when we pray. Verses 5 through 8, we need to have an attitude when we pray. And verses 9 through 13, we need encouragement to pray. So first, we need to make specific requests. Verses 1 through 4, the setting is straightforward. It's an ordinary day. Jesus, as he often does in the Gospels, goes off to pray. We're not sure what the disciples do while Jesus goes off to pray. I've often wondered, but we don't know. Jesus prays, he comes back, and when Jesus finishes, an unnamed disciple makes a request, Lord, teach us to pray like John the Baptist taught his disciples. Jesus answers that request by giving six steps to his disciples. Jesus begins his answer by saying simply, when you pray. Notice that. When you pray. It's When? There aren't any specific instructions on how long or how often or what time. Uh, Back in the 80s, uh, there was a book written by a pastor from Texas uh, called Could You Not Tarry One Hour? And there was a prayer movement where the idea was to get uh, individuals to pray an hour a day. Our church was part of that, and we sought to do that. Uh, It flamed out. Uh, It didn't endure. Um, and, and it was, I want to suggest, a fairly heavy load to, to carry. We might get a hint when we see daily bread mentioned, but there are no set times, no frequency. There, there, listen, Jesus doesn't even say, make sure you pray before every meal with heads bowed and eyes closed. He, he gives no such instruction. And You might be offended at Jesus' lack of religious practice. We might think we're more godly than Jesus. But I want to remind you, Jesus looks on the heart in the way we approach this topic of prayer. There are two things in our heart that determine when we pray. Now, I will be the first to acknowledge that having a plan to pray is good. I'm not looking at the practice, I'm looking at our hearts. And there are two things that are essential. The first is our helplessness, and the second is our faith. These are internal realities. So, Ole Halsby, in his classic book on prayer, says, what is that attitude of heart which God recognizes as prayer? I'd mention two things. In the first place, helplessness. This is unquestionably the first and surest indicator of a praying heart. As far as I can see, prayer has been ordained only for the helpless. It's the last resort of the helpless indeed, the very last way out. He continues, without faith there can be no prayer, no matter how great our helplessness may be. Helplessness united with faith produces prayer. Biblical example for you would be Jonah. Jonah is an Old Testament prophet chosen by God to give the great city of Nineveh a prophetic word of repentance, and 
<laughs> Jonah doesn't like it. Um, he doesn't want the Ninevites to be treated kindly and mercifully by God. So he goes in the opposite direction on a ship. Storm comes up. You probably know the story. And the sailors are scared to death. They cast lots to, discern, to decide who the problem is. And the problem is Jonah. The lot falls to Jonah. And Jonah says, throw me overboard. That's your only chance. So they throw him overboard. And the text says a great fish swallows him. And then beginning at chapter 2 in Jonah, you read, and Jonah prayed <laughs> from the belly of the great fish because he was truly helpless and he knew God existed, was real, and so he appealed to God. Here's, here's the thing. We don't want to be helpless. We hate the thought. We want to be competent, capable, strong, in control. We train our children to be every one of those things. We do not train them to be helpless. And I'm speaking spiritually, of course. We don't like it. Tim Chester again. In many ways, it's a mistake to focus on prayer itself as if prayer was some kind of skill to be acquired We've seen that prayer is an act of a child asking her father for help. And you don't have to teach a child to ask for things. Amen? I mean, those of us that are parents, right? <laughs> that never got around to that one. All that a child needs to know is that she is needy and her father loves her. All you need to know to pray well is that you're needy and your heavenly father loves you. So here's how it works. We can be defeated full of self-pity, see no hope, but not be helpless. Sometimes we have not come to the proverbial end of our rope. We're not there yet. But we feel beat. We feel like there's nowhere to go. Theologian John Calvin of reform fame, sovereignty of God fame, devotes some 46 pages to prayer in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, he highlights the necessity of faith. He says, quote, nothing is more accordant to the nature of prayer than to lay it down as a fixed rule that is not to come forth at random, but is to follow in the footsteps of faith. In short, it is faith that obtains everything in prayer. And you know how we gain faith, right? Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. That's how we grow in faith. So when you pray, you say certain words. You can pray silently. You can pray aloud. But you are saying words to God. And the important thing is not to say this prayer by memory or rote. We don't simply recite it. The thing is to pray the principles that are here. So we'll look at them in turn. First, say, Father. Notice, not Son, not Spirit, not Mary, not the saints. Say, Father. I've had the privilege here uh, to do the pastoral prayer quite regularly. And if you pay any attention, uh, you'll notice I always begin with our Father in heaven. Because that's what Jesus said that we should do as we pray. So the Gospel of Matthew has a slightly longer and more detailed prayer, but again, same basic principles. Now, the word Father should leap off the page to you. One of the advantages of being familiar with the Scriptures is 80% is Old Testament. And if you know the Old Testament at all, you will notice that Father does not appear there. Now, God is without change. Right? God is constant, so his said mercy, loving kindness was there all through the Old Testament. But the Old Testament experience of God was a God on Mount Sinai who is holy to be feared. He's not to be approached. He's not safe, though he's later revealed as merciful. But he's now a father who gave us a son, and we are in that son, and so we have free access to approach our Heavenly Father. A good father loves, provides what is best, 
that is, does not give a child everything they ask for, provides what is best and protects. A father is, according to recent studies, actually more instrumental in the development of the faith of children than mom is. If the dad models godliness and affection for his children, they, they will thrive and they will prosper quite often. Martin Lloyd-Jones again. If you should ask me to state in one phrase what I regard as the greatest defect in most Christian lives, I would say it's our failure to know God as our Father as we should know Him. Ah, yes, we say. We know that and believe it. But Lloyd-Jones says, but do we know it in our daily life and living? I know you know it on a test. I know you check off true. But do you know God as your Father in your daily life and living? Our Heavenly Father hears our prayers because we're in Christ. Our Heavenly Father will not reject the prayers of His Son Jesus, and He will not reject our prayers either because we're family. Our Heavenly Father is for us, not against us. He's lavished us with grace and mercy. He's promised to never leave us. He cares for us. Children bring petitions to Dad, and therefore your view of God as Father matters in order for you to bring requests to Him. So when we fail to pray, the first culprit is this. We have a defective view of Father. David in Psalm 62 once God has spoken, twice I've heard this, that power belongs to God and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. When we doubt His power, prayer is obviously a waste of time and it's nothing but a magic incantation. When we doubt His love, prayer is simply a dreary duty. So, consider your Heavenly Father cares for you. Love to spend more time on God as Father, but got to move along. Uh, second, hallowed be your name. This is the aching cry of a heart longing for our Heavenly Father to be worshipped, adored, honored, exalted in all the earth. His name is His character, and one day the glory of the Lord will cover the face of the earth, and we long for that day. We pray that God will be worshipped as He deserves, so we ask that God would reveal His glory and holiness everywhere. So here's an example of praying the Scripture, Psalm 108, 3 to 5. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I'll sing praises to you among the nations, for your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. That's what it means for God's name to be hallowed in our experience. Third, your kingdom come. In my younger years, I had little time for theology and doctrine. My take was, it's been debated for centuries and they haven't settled it. What am I going to add to the debate? And so, I had lots of books on marriage and parenting and, and sought to devote myself to that. And that's, that's good as far as it goes. Um, but then we come to a phrase like this, your kingdom come. And now, theology becomes essential, not optional. Because we need to understand what we're asking when we say kingdom. The kingdom of God is the rule and reign of God. More specifically, the kingdom is the rule and reign of God in the hearts of men, women, and children. The kingdom is not physical. When Jesus is having his discussion with Pilate, this is John 18, 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. The kingdom of Christ is not of this world, but you will find countless attempts to orient the kingdom into this world, despite the words of Jesus. Paul in Romans 14, 17 says, the kingdom of God's not a matter of eating and drinking, but this, righteousness peace, and joy in 
the Holy Spirit. So the kingdom of God is not the visible church because in the visible church, Jesus said there's wheat and tares. There's good and bad. You've got both. We, we by no means assume every person here is regenerated, born again, and following Jesus. We don't even consider that of members, that we do our best to consider and take that into account. We have both in the church. The kingdom of God is spiritual, not physical. Again, countless attempts to make it physical. The kingdom of God is therefore not governments and armies. The kingdom has come and one day will come in fullness. It's the already and not yet. When we pray for the kingdom of God to come, we are at a minimum praying for souls to be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. This is ultimate. The kingdom of God in the Gospels can break in when healing occurs because the deeds of darkness are overturned, but we do not major on the physical but the spiritual because, though we pray for folks, what good is it if everyone is healed only to die and spend eternity separated from God? What good is that? It's no eternal good. And so we major, so we pray for folks, we believe in healing, but We are concerned with spiritual realities that are eternal. There is a teaching out there that says healing should always occur and will unless you lack faith because we pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And since God's will is always done there, then God's will should always be done here on earth. But the error is they lose sight of the gospel and everybody dies one day. So healing will not always occur in this life, though we pray for healing and believe in it. There's also a teaching that says, in essence, Christians should rule the world, the arts, government, business, media, etc. The major here is on the temporal, but the kingdom is not of this world, and the kingdom is spiritual, and so we care about disciples and we care about souls. Christians are salt and light. We do good works, but we never lose our grip on the cross the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our eyes are fixed on eternity as we labor in this life. Fourth, give us each day our daily bread. Daily bread is provision. It is shelter, clothes, food. Our Heavenly Father knows our needs before we ask, and we ask that we would have more than we need because we desire to give and share with others. Those commands run throughout the Bible. The Bible tells us God is our provider. He gives gifts. He gives strength. He gives health. We look to Him for everything because He is God and we are not. We never, and here's a principle of prayer, we never want to be in a position where we have not because we ask not. But in James 4, we're told that's the case. James 4, 2, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. We never want to be in the place where we do not have because we did not ask. Fifth, forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. The Christian lives a lifestyle of forgiveness. The Christian always has a heart of forgiveness. Our sins are many. His mercy is more. We sin by commission, uh, things we do we shouldn't do, and we sin by omission, things we should do that we, in fact, don't do. We sin because all manner of evil exists in our heart. When we're born again, we receive a new heart. The power of sin is broken, but sin remains a fight. So Jesus says what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. This defiles a person because, again, Jesus always pays attention to the heart first. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, Matthew 15. This is why wisdom literature instructs us to watch our heart. We're wise to take great care at what we sow into our heart because we do reap a harvest out of our heart. So Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Happily, our God is faithful. We've already commented this morning. He's faithful to forgive us our sins. 1 John 1.8 
to 10 tells us if we confess our sins, he's faithful and he will forgive us our sins and it is all of our sins. So forgive us our sins for we forgive everyone indebted to us. I say again, the Christian always lives with a heart of forgiveness. We will be wronged, but we forgive. We forgive completely and fully. We do not take revenge and we certainly don't go toward bitterness. Uh, Think of Jesus on the cross. He forgives. Think of Stephen being stoned in Acts. He forgives. We glorify God when we forgive others who have wronged us, truly wronged us. We have a heart of forgiveness. We might not have reconciliation with them. That's a two-way street. But our heart is always at a place where we're eager to forgive. And Jesus tells us to pray to this end. Sixth, lead us not into temptation. God does not tempt us to sin, but temptation does come. Friends, I know you know this, but remember, temptations don't come with a two-minute warning. There's no sign posted. Warning, temptation ahead, 15 seconds, prepare yourself. Your preparation for fighting temptation must be done before the temptation comes. So we pray asking that we be not led into temptation. We are proactive. We get out ahead of it. So are you fighting anger? Well, what are you praying? Are you fighting coveting or sexual impurity? Well, what are you praying? Pray to avoid temptation. Pray to see temptation coming and pray to fight temptation. We don't live in a time of peace, but we live in a time of war. So you pray like this. These are the principles. Father, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us daily bread, forgive us our sins, and lead us not into temptation. We need to make specific requests when we pray. But Jesus says these are the things that are of the highest priority. These are the things he wants us to truly care about most. So second, we need an attitude when we pray, verses 5 through 8. Jesus loves to tell a story to make his point. He's instructed his disciples how to pray, what to say, but now he's concerned about the attitude with which we pray. The story involves hospitality. A friend comes to a neighbor, so the neighbor needs bread. They usually prepare it early in the day. They don't have any, so he gets up, goes to his neighbor, but the neighbor is in bed. Neighbor doesn't want to get up, but he gets up because of his impudence, which means persistence. This does not say anything about the heart of God because our God is a generous king. He is a giving God. It is not that in prayer we nag him. This is meant to examine our attitude when we pray. We're invited to pray with shameless boldness and persistence. We're invited to ask with boldness and keep on asking. In a sense, the question is this, how badly do you want it? The neighbor wanted the bread, kept banging on the door. The question is, what's the posture of our heart? Our prayer, if you can relate to me, sometimes is I toss up a request and I drop it. Let it ride without an answer. There's no impudence to it. I simply move on. So God is sovereign over all. There's no way we order God around, but he loves faith in his children, and he loves prayers that are bold. So we said prayers informed by two realities, our helplessness and our faith. What things in the world do you desire to see change for the glory of God? Where are you helpless? Salvation of folks we love, family and friends, perhaps the health of your marriage, perhaps the spread of the gospel, we can touch an effect anywhere in the world. We can go anywhere with our prayers. Perhaps you're hungry for revival. There's leaders and rulers to pray for, uh, for the gospel to spread. There's justice and righteousness that's in short supply in the world. Wherever darkness is in need of light, let us bring large requests to our great God. No request is too large. No request is too small. Uh, We're people who attempt great things for God and we take risks, but we pray because we are helpless on our own. We can do nothing apart from Jesus. 
We are helpless spiritually. And so we are wise to pray. So we bring specific requests and we possess a persistent boldness to ask. Third, we need encouragement to pray, verses 9 through 13. Prayer is hard work for most of us. Uh, the reasons include we don't always see ourselves as helpless and we can lack faith. It's so hard that many of us give up on prayer altogether. Perhaps a certain cynicism sets into our lives and we become cold toward prayer. D.A. Carson writes, I doubt there is any Christian who's not sometimes found it difficult to pray. So if you're in that boat, you're welcome here, and I'm in that boat with you. In itself, this is neither surprising nor depressing. It's not surprising because we're still pilgrims with many lessons to learn. It's not depressing because struggling with such matters is part of the way we learn. What is both surprising and depressing is the sheer prayerlessness that characterizes so much of the Western church. So Jesus offers us encouragement to pray when Jesus says, and I tell you, we should pay attention. And I tell you, he says, ask, seek, knock, ask, it'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Verse 11 assures us this is for everyone. The danger is we give up. We conclude prayer doesn't make a difference. We decide it's too much work, so we don't ask. We don't seek, and we don't knock. But friends, we must not give up. In Luke 18, Jesus tells a parable to help us pray and not give up. Why is it that we are prone to give up on prayer? I suggest it's because at root, we're not sufficiently helpless, and we lack faith in our Father. So we decide this. And you can think along with me in deciding how you think about prayer. But perhaps we decide we simply enjoy something else more. Don't feel like it. I feel like this. I'd rather, and you can fill in the blank. I'd rather be doing this than pray. Right? Or perhaps you have something more urgent and important to do. Kids won't raise themselves. Grass won't cut itself because I'm praying. Tasks around the house won't get done because I pray. Oh, and I need to work because that, that won't happen if I just pray. So I got more urgent, more important things to do. Perhaps you perceive no answer. And that is certainly something we struggle with as we pray. And what more to say, I don't doubt, in this series. Here in Luke 11, Jesus reminds us a good father gives good gifts, even evil fathers. And this is encouraging. There's no reluctance noticed. So he says, if you ask for a fish, there'll be a serpent. Or if you ask for an egg, there won't be a scorpion. Um, common food versus common dangers. Also, items mentioned in Luke 10 repeated here. So our father gives good gifts. But then we have a surprise. We have quite the turn if... If I was, if you if you'd give me the beginning verses of this unit and then asked me how it's going to conclude, I wouldn't come up with this conclusion. But Jesus says, how much more will God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? The ministry of the Holy Spirit is vital for the Christian. Your pastors often pray before we gather, and one of the things we pray is that the Spirit would be present and meet with us because we need the Spirit. The Spirit comforts us, encourages us, gives us good gifts. The Spirit empowers us. The Spirit convicts us of sin. The Spirit leads us in righteousness. In short, we need the Spirit to lead us in godliness and ministry. We receive the Spirit at conversion, but many experiences follow. So, friend, do you pray for the Holy Spirit? J.C. Ryle puts it this way. Diligence in prayer is the secret of eminent holiness. There are some of the Lord's people who never seem able to get on from the time of their conversion. They're born again, 
but they remain babes all their lives. There are others of the Lord's people who seem to be always advancing. How could we account for the difference which I've just described? What is the reason that some believers are so much brighter and holier than others? I believe the difference, says Ryle, in 19 cases out of 20 arises from different habits in prayer. I believe that those who are not eminently holy pray little. And those who are eminently holy pray much. In other words, our lives reveal our prayers because there's a correlation going on. So important is prayer for growth. So dependent are we on God that one minister, Robert Murray McShane, put it this way, a man is what he is on his knees before God and nothing more. That's because in prayer, we face our helplessness, we face our faith, and we face our desires. J.C. Rowell again, praying and sinning will never live together in the same heart. Prayer will consume sin, or sin will choke prayer. So prayer is a wonderful privilege. Personal prayer is important. An old hymn tells us what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And corporate prayer is important. We gather to pray Sunday mornings before the meeting. Uh, we pray in our community groups regularly. And perhaps with the facility, we will pray together corporately more often as a church, uh, as I've gotten older, and I confess when I was younger, I did not value this much, but as I've gotten older, I appreciate corporate prayer more than ever, and I was talking with my son Jared recently over the Christmas break, and we were discussing churches and corporate prayer, and he pulled out a quote from Spurgeon that I got to share with you. Spurgeon at a prayer meeting says, what a company we have here tonight. It fills my heart with gladness and my eyes with tears of joy to see so many hundreds of persons gathered together at what is sometimes wickedly described as, quote, only a prayer meeting, end quote. It is good for us to draw nigh unto God in prayer and especially good to make up a great congregation for such a purpose. We've attended little prayer meetings of four or five, and we've been glad to be there, for we had the promise of the Lord's presence, but our minds are grieved to see so little attention given to united prayer by many in our churches. We've longed to see great numbers of God's people coming up to pray, and we now enjoy this sight. Let us praise God that it is so. How could we expect a blessing if we were too idle to ask for it? Remember I said we don't want to be in the position of not having because we didn't ask. How could we look for a Pentecost if we never met with one accord in one place to wait upon the Lord? Brethren, we shall never see much change for the better in our churches in general till the prayer meeting occupies a higher place in the esteem of Christians. So let me conclude. Jesus teaches us to pray. Surely we do well to study the Master, the only one who ever prayed flawlessly and learned from Him, the Master tells us, we need to pray with specific requests. We need to pray with an attitude, and we need encouragement to pray. As we boldly approach a sovereign God, we submit ourselves to His will. He is our Father. We approach our Father because we're helpless, and we are loved. Jesus said His house, the church, will be called a house of prayer. May it be so here at Redemption Hill Church, and may these next six or so sermons Teach us how to pray and serve us in our praying. J.C. Ryle, one last time. Prayer is that point of all others in religion at which you must most be on your guard. Here it is, the true religion starts. Here it flourishes and here it decays. Tell me what a man's prayers are and I will soon tell you the state of his soul. Prayer is a spiritual pulse. By this, the spiritual health may always be tested. Prayer is a spiritual weather glass. By this, we must always know whether it is fair or foul in our hearts. Oh, let us keep an eye continually upon our private devotions. Let me share with you my testimony regarding prayer. I've come to believe much more strongly in prayer than I did as a young person. 
and God has been faithful, and I give God glory in this. When I was a young believer, I did not pray. I mean, sure, at meals and maybe when others prayed, but I, I did not pray. And I want to encourage our young people to not repeat my error. Don't make my mistake of not praying even in your youth, no matter your age. Got married to Beth. We married young. Had kids. We're in that season of having kids and nursing. And uh, we struggle with intimacy. And we're like, this is ridiculous. Sinners all over the world are sinning. Couples all seem to be fine. And here we are stuck. And this is not uncommon for couples, by the way. If you happen to be there, it's not unusual at all. The question is, how do you respond? Well, what Beth and I did was prayed every time before we came together. We prayed because we were helpless. I mean, we were stuck. Like, it wasn't like there was some hope flickering. Uh, we were stuck. And so we came together and prayed because we needed help. So you would think, as smart as I am, that we would continue in prayer together. Uh, nope, nope, didn't do that. We drifted due to my lack of leadership. And uh, a few years go by, 15 or so, and we have two sons not doing well. Beth and I are helpless again. One of them's now a pastor, one's a lawyer, they're following the Lord, it's all good. But we came together and we prayed earnestly because we were stuck. I mean, we were helpless. We had done everything we knew to do. Like we had checked all the boxes in our minds, and things weren't well. And so we came together and prayed. So you would think I would have learned from that, right? Um, who wouldn't? Uh, well, um, another lapse in time goes by, and then we begin to pray together daily just because there's so many needs and hurts we're, we're working with, and it can feel overwhelming. Now, our youngest son does not yet follow Jesus. He's running the other way as fast as he can. He's quite clear. I mean, there, there's no, you think maybe he's born again? Like, there, there's no. No, he's clear. None of that. I'm rejecting it all together. And um, as far as I'm concerned, he doesn't stand a chance. Because we pray for him constantly. And um, I told Beth, I think this is one we're in for the long haul. I'd love to be wrong more than I am. Uh, I think this is one we'll come to faith after I'm gone. Um, but that's okay. I'm fully persuaded he will. And we're praying and laying hold of the Lord because the Lord can do that. Nothing is too hard for him. Nothing is impossible. So, I want to ask you, are there any needs in your life? Marriage, family, provision? Are you helpless? Are you at the end of your rope yet? Are you trusting the Lord? Do you have faith that He can move? If so, I want to encourage you to pray. One last testimony. At Living Hope, we undertook a building campaign. Uh, we were just a church full of ordinary folks, and we didn't have large checks dropping out of the air like some churches that I know of. <laughs> we had to work and pray for our provision. So we formed a prayer team. And, and remarkably to me, uh, one generous member's business explodes, uh, huge income, and he gives generously to the project. A new member comes who is retired, and he gives 60000 a year for years um, out, of, out of his retirement funds and one larger gift. Um, but that was after we started to pray. And one member in the church had stock options in a company bought out by Microsoft and got over 800000 uh, bucks, and he gave generously. Like, but this is be we went to the Lord in prayer, and the Lord moved in provision. And... We felt helpless, but we knew God could move. So, friends, do you pray? We have every encouragement to do so. The Father has loved us. 
The Son has given us grace, and the Holy Spirit comforts us. So listen to these sermons on prayer and evaluate, and then think about your approach to prayer. I'm promising you to endure. It begins with a sense of helplessness and a sense of faith. But I'm not, I'm not asking you this morning to become an overnight hero. Like, okay, I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps, and I'm going to start praying an hour a day. I'm not. I'm saying this morning, think about where you are. Think about your heart toward the Lord and your heart in prayer. Think about where your life is at. And I'm asking, is there any place where you're helpless? And if you're at that place, then you are foolish to not draw near to the Lord in prayer. Every husband for families with husbands and wives, every husband will lead his family and his wife in their response and practice. As heads of home, we will all work at this together in our families. And if you're single, consider a prayer partner because that would help encourage you and help you get strength. And one last thing I want to say, and I went longer, so I thought I might. Um, I want to say again, young people, avoid my mistakes when it comes to prayer. Um, <laughs> back in high school, uh, we were on a retreat, and... Um, a speaker spoke, and we gathered together, and uh, four, four kids, one of whom was Beth, went off to pray, and they came back and said, I believe the Lord wants to meet with us, and it remains to this day uh, my most powerful encounter with the Lord because he showed up and met with us, and... Um, I, at the time, thought that was normal. That's what always happens. But I haven't had that experience since. And um, I want to point out that it was four young people that got together to pray. The Lord seems to delight in young people seeking the Lord. Now, we all, we all have value in this. But there, when you look back through church history and look at revivals, it's often young people pray and God breaks out and and moves. So, I want to encourage our young people uh, to be serious about faith and to be serious about seeking the Lord and to look to Him to move. I'd like to pray, and uh, yeah, we'll sing a song in closing because I mentioned the song in the sermon. The worship team comes forward, I'll pray. Lord, Lord, our hearts are prone to drift prone to drift. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. Lord, I pray that as we begin this new year, and I pray that as we look at this topic of prayer over the next six or so weeks, I pray that you would help us to see our helplessness, and I pray that you would help us to see you in all your glory and might and power, and help us to trust you. Lord, forgive us our pride. Forgive us our stubbornness and our obstinance. Forgive us for cynicism. Lord, we have all drifted in many ways. But I pray that you would light a fire in our lives and in our hearts that enable us to pray, to pray the Lord's Prayer and to bring other requests to you for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.